Hello YouTube, my name is Zach, and today I'm going to be solving a problem that I have found exists all across YouTube, all across the internet. But first, let me present this question to you. Do you feel like you read singing terms on the internet and there's like seven different definitions of all of them and you just don't know which one to believe? I see that so much myself that sometimes it makes me question what I know. And so I know that for someone who is on the outside, not studied on the subject, they're probably really confused. Now I know that every single freaking voice teacher on YouTube has done the same kind of video and they've tried to define terms in all sorts of different ways. So all I'm gonna do is stick to what I've learned in my studies at college. I'm not gonna try to extrapolate on definitions. I'm not gonna do anything like that. I'm just gonna try to give a little small glossary of super important singing term that you definitely should know when you get into singing or voice study. And these are terms that are gonna be applicable basically everywhere. There are certain terms here that will cause confusion. I know that for a fact, and I'm going to try my best to clarify this as best as I can. If you need any kind of verification or validation on any of my terms, check out nats.org. I preach it all the time. The Journal of Singing is about as close to a source on academic singing materials as you're gonna find without taking a vocal ped class. So. Check that stuff out because I don't think I teach anything that falls outside the lines of what Nats or the National Association of Teachers of Singing advocates or teaches for. I try to be very strict and diligent about those kinds of things. The first term I'm going to talk about is bel canto. Bel canto specifically is translated to beautiful singing. And bel canto singing is used predominantly in classical settings. Now, there are a lot of modern voice teachers that kind of scoff at this term and they say that it's antiquated and that it's dated and that, you know, bel canto or beautiful singing is a poor choice of words because how do you define what beautiful singing is and is not? There are lots of specific qualities and characteristics of the sounds and the methods used to create the bel canto technique or the bel canto singing approach, but in a practical sense, the most important thing to know is that bel canto singing is a style of singing that originated in the 19th century predominantly that was designed for stage singing or what we would consider classical singing today. Most contemporary singers are using a non-bel canto approach. That does not mean that their singing is not beautiful, but the techniques they use typically do not fall under bel canto standards. One of the biggest ways to tell if someone's singing bel canto is simple. If they're using a microphone, they're probably not singing with bel canto technique because bel canto technique was designed before a microphone was even invented. And some of the methods that we use for projection with technology today just aren't compatible with the ways that you sing in a bel canto technique anyway. So the most important thing to take away from this is that bel canto technique is a classical singing technique, classical singing method that is applied for stage singing predominantly for specific classical repertoire and art song. Do not buy into the misnomer that people attach to their own singing techniques and teaching methods of it being bel canto. Just because someone says they teach bel canto does not mean that they teach bel canto. Next up is vocal register. Now your vocal register refers to the placement of the usage of the voice. So there are several different ways that people define these, but I'm going to tell you the registers as I know them and as almost any vocal academic is going to tell you. You have the MO register, which is the fry register. You have the M1 register, which is the modal register, or some people will call the chest voice. You have the M2 register, which is the head voice or the falsetto. And then you have the M3, which is the whistle register. Now, I'm gonna cover these definitions very quickly and demonstrate. The fry register is the sound that the voice makes down here and the vocal folds just, they kind of flap together very loosely. Um, and typically the fry register is safe in men's voices and safe sparingly in women's voices, but a lot of times when you find women that overly use fry register and they're singing and speaking, they tend to run into more vocal injuries. The M1 register or the modal register is what we use to speak and it's obviously perfectly healthy because we use it all the time. As long as we're phonating and creating full chord closure when we speak and sing in the M1 register, it's probably gonna be healthy. And it does mean that to be able to sing in the, the extensions of the range of the M1 register, like the high or the low of the modal, you may have to make some type of phonatory adjustments for it to be safe, the modal register is what we use when we speak and it is generally the safest form of phonation that you can do. Falsetto or the head voice, these terms are interchangeable. One of the most common misconceptions that I hear from people is they there's this pervading idea that the head voice and the falsetto are different. They're not. 
The head voice and the falsetto are the same thing. They're both referring to the M2 register, which is the register above the modal register. What's happened is some of these modern contemporary teachers have mangled the terms around and tried to say things like, oh, well, I'm using falsetto here when I do, ah, and then I'm using head voice when I go, ah, or something like slightly different phonatory principles. But what they're actually doing is they're using the M2 or the head voice slash falsetto register, and they're just changing the amount of chord closure that they create throughout the process of the falsetto. One of the most important things to point out about the falsetto is that since the head voice and the falsetto are both within the same register, the terms can be used interchangeably. Now, this has caused a lot of controversy in music history and, and, and throughout the study of the voice because it's commonly thought in, in, in my school of, of study and in, in the Italian school of singing and in most classical studies that females do not have a falsetto register, but they have a head voice. The argument is very semantics heavy, and I'm not necessarily a big fan of even getting into the discussion. To keep things simple for myself, I like to say that women have a head voice and men have a falsetto, although they are both of the same mode. They're both M2 registers. I just think that the tonal qualities of the male falsetto is so drastically different from the M2 register of the woman's voice that I think it's important to separate them. You do not often find men singing predominantly in the falsetto unless they're like a countertenor and they, they're singing something like a, a female part. And while the falsetto in men does create a more effeminate tone in the phonation, very rarely do you find a man singing in falsetto that creates the exact same sonic qualities that women create. Now, you do see it sometimes, so I'm not going to completely dismiss that as a possibility. It does happen. But in the vast majority of cases, the woman's head voice is much fuller and it has a much wider variety of vocal timbres and colors that it create than the male falsetto. So I like to personally differentiate them, and I've always been taught that way, that the men have falsetto, women have head voice. You also find in opera and classical singing, women use their head voices a whole, whole lot more than men use their falsetto. So there is that as well. You typically don't get as strong of form at frequencies or pitches that allow the, the voice to carry over the orchestra throughout the male head voice or falsetto as you do in the female head voice. So that's another argument worth considering. The M3 register is the whistle register. Now back when I made my Steve Perry video, I said I don't know of many men at all that can do a whistle register, a true one. And some people have shown me a few men who do indeed have whistle registers, and they're the real deal. They're an M3 register, but they're extremely rare, and I am not convinced that they can be trained. I've seen people show their methods of teaching someone to use one, and, and some of the methods include things like inhalatory phonation, in other words, breathing in and singing, and those kinds of methods are some of the most destructive things you can do to your voice. So I'm convinced that a whistle register in a male is an extreme outlier, and you don't see it very much. That does exist, but I'm still not convinced that it's something that can be trained into a voice. I've never seen it happen. I've I've never seen a man be trained into a whistle voice ever. And I've worked with hundreds of voices and I've seen tons of people go through voice study in college and in other places. So I'm sure that they're out there, but it's exceedingly rare. Next up is the term passaggio. The passaggio or the point of passage is the place in the voice where one register wants to move into the next. Now that does not mean that you have to stick to the passaggio to continue to phonate. You hear very often people sing in chest voices far beyond their passaggio and, and stick with their chest voice or their modal register far beyond what their natural passaggio would want them to do. But the passaggio is the point in which the voice has to make the greatest adjustment to either stay in the same register or to move into the next one. My passaggio as a baritone is somewhere around an E flat four. At that point, I really want to either move into my falsetto or I have to completely change my internal structure of my throat and my mouth to be able to continue to move up in the chest voice. So the passaggio put simply is the point in the range where the voice wants to transition from one register to the next. Next up, tessitura. The term tessitura can refer to a couple of things. One, it can refer to the singer's comfort zone. In other words, the range of pitches where the voice is most comfortable or the most efficient. And it can also refer to the average section of a range that a piece operates in. So for example, if I sung a piece that stuck mostly between the ranges of say F3 and B3, that range of pieces would be the tessitura of the piece. Now that does not mean that the 
piece doesn't go below or above those, but it stays predominantly in that little range. That would be the tessitura of that specific piece. The next term is range. And range sounds simple, and it really is, but I think people overcomplicate it. The range is the lowest point that a voice can phonate to the highest point that a voice can phonate. However, this is where it gets confusing. In singing, range typically refers to the point in which the voice can operate the most efficiently and still sound pleasant or pleasing. So a range of a singer can be a lot smaller than the overall range that the singer can phonate at. One of the most misleading things you see on the internet in places like the range place is that they take any instance of someone burping out a whatever note, uh, and they put that as part of the range, and then they take the highest point uh, anyone ever makes a sound for any reason, and they say that's the highest point of the range. But that's really not honest. It's kind of disingenuous because that isn't necessarily the range of utility that that singer has. Just because someone burps out a note one time doesn't mean that's a part of their regular singing range. Now, in all fairness, technically, yes, the extension of the entirety of the range is as low as they can go and as high as they can go. But in a practical sense, you have to think, how much are these notes used? Where is the singer the most comfortable? And at what point do you hit those extensions of the range where they start losing quality of phonation? And that's where the end of the range happens. For example, I can probably burp out an extremely low note. Like, let's see. Uh, I have no idea what pitch that even was. You perfect pitch folks can probably determine what note that was. But I don't use that ever. And I could probably... Woo! I don't even know what note that was. I mean, that's probably not very high in terms of like tenor high pitches, but you see what I'm saying? Like I can squawk that note out, but that doesn't mean that I'm going to use it practically. My range for all intents and purposes is something like G2 to maybe E flat four. That's about my range that I use frequently. So when you look at classifying me, which conveniently is the next term we're going to go to, that's more what you would look at is my functional range. On that note, the next term we're going to talk about is Fach. And Fach is German for class. And the Fach is mostly a term used for composers in order to give the composer an idea of what to expect out of specific voice types and allow the composers to write melodies and singing lines that fit within the range of that specific voice type. So for example, I'm a bass baritone. Since a bass baritone's voice is typically pretty booming and loud and powerful, we get assigned a lot of the villain roles and our ranges of pitches usually go somewhere between G2 to sometimes G4, maybe A4 every now and then. But most of the time we're in that two octave range and that's where we stay. I rarely ever go above an F or an F sharp. Almost never. So there are a multitude of different fox or classes, but the biggest thing I would tell contemporary singers is to not even worry about this because it has very little practical use in terms of your own singing and your own composing. You know your own range better than anybody, and if you're not trying to give it to a composer to write, then as long as it's comfortable for you, then stick with it. You really don't need to worry about what Fach you fit into. If you were going to go into classical music, it's vitally important that you understand and learn your Fach, but otherwise, I wouldn't worry about it too much. Now, next up, I'm going to deal with a couple of terms that have caused me more headache than any other terms I've used since I started this channel. There are many different interpretations of these words, and I'm going to try to do my best to get to the bottom of them. The first term is mixed voice. Now, the mixed voice, in my understanding, in my utility, in my pedagogy, and everything I've ever learned, is a tiny little series of notes that meets in the middle of the head voice and the chest voice, or the M1 and the M2 registers. When you move into your head voice, there's a process that the folds have to slightly separate to be able to create that airier, hootier, whistly sort of head voice sound. The pitches that you can sing during the process of the separation is your mixed voice. Now, people can train themselves to have a wider range of mixed voice tones, but in a practical sense, your mixed voice is usually only about five pitches before it moves completely into a head voice or goes completely out into a modal register or chest voice. So all these people that say they have a two octave mixed voice, they're full of it because what they're effectively saying is that they can hold their vocal folds in some sort of like in between closed and open position, which just doesn't make any sense. When the folds fully close, they then peel back to create the mix. And the pitches that you sing as that peeling process happens. When the folds fully close and they want to move into the head voice, they begin to peel back. And the pitches that you sing as it peels back, 
would be what are your mixed tones, your mixed voice notes. Once the folds have fully reached their separated position, you're in your head voice. So I don't believe people who say they have massive mixed voice ranges. Now, I've heard some beautiful, well-coordinated mixed tones, but I don't believe that anyone has a two-octave mixed voice range. I just don't believe it because that's counter to how the voice even works. Now, the next term is compression. And what's happened here with compression is that these contemporary voice teachers have just taken this term and run with it. And you talk to five different voice teachers, they're going to tell you five different definitions of what compression actually is. So what I did is I got to the source and figured out where the term compression comes from. And it just so happens that the pedagogist who taught my voice teacher, Dr. Barbara Dosher, has referred to compression as well. And some other pedagogists from around her era have also used the term but they use it in conjunction with a medical term. The medical term is medial compression, M-E-D-I-A-L compression. Now, I am not into this kind of stuff. This is not my area of expertise. So I can only tell you so much, but I do know from my research that medial compression is part of the process of the beginning of the folds phonating. The thing about medial compression is that what it actually is, is the amount that your folds push together and the process by which they do it. Your arytenoid muscles are the muscles that cause the folds to push together. The arytenoid muscles are called the transverse and the oblique. And when the transverse and the oblique arytenoid muscles press together, they create something called medial compression. And that medial compression is what makes the folds close and begin the process of the vibration that causes them to phonate. Here's the thing. You can't physically control medial compression. It happens on its own. Think about it. I could tell you to flex your arm muscle, right? That's pretty easy. But if I told you to press your arytenoids together, could you do it? Like you can't, right? How, how do you, what muscle are you even moving? Medial compression is a phonatory process that happens without us having active control over it. When people say that you can control the compression of your voice, it's not true because the actual term they're referring to, medial compression, is something that is not actively controllable by us. So be leery when people talk about compression. Now you know what it is and now you know why these people saying to control the compression of your voice are not telling you the truth. And the final term and the most important singing term of all of them in my view is legato. Legato in any instrument is a sense of smoothness and connectedness from pitch to pitch. And singing legato is extremely important because we speak in a legato fashion. And I've given this demonstration countless times. But if I talk like this, my phrase doesn't make sense. And the reason is that that sense of connectedness, that sound that carries through all the words that I speak, isn't connected. And that's how we communicate. We're internally attuned to hearing one another communicate in a legato fashion, whether we actively control it when we sing or not. Now, the difference between this and compression is that you can control the amount of legato you put on your singing. So, for example, compare the two scales. Ah, and ah. If you listen, the first one had a greater sense of connectedness and the second one was like, nope, 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 nope. It was more rigid and sort of more jagged from pitch to pitch. The first is more desirable because that's closer to how we speak. The second is more controlled and forced from note to note. So unless you're singing in very specific styles, a legato approach to singing is generally more desirable. Now, there are many instruments this does not apply to where you aren't always using a legato style. But in singing, 99% of the time, if you're pursuing a legato sound, you're probably going to be okay. So I hope that this video helped you better understand some of these terms. I know that some of the stuff's super confusing, and I hope I didn't just make it more confusing for you. Please feel free to ask me some questions about these things in the comments. I'd be more than happy to answer them for you. I know there's a crazy wide world of confusion out there when it comes to singing terminology, but I gave you everything I could to the best of my ability, and I didn't sit here and read off of a dictionary either. I tried to give you some sort of answer that actually comes from understanding rather than just reading off of a page. I also have a new thumbnail in case you all didn't see that. I hope it grabbed your attention and uh, I've tried to fix the lighting a little bit. So if you have any other technical suggestions for this video, please let me know because I am trying to increase the presentation quality of my content. So if you have feedback in that regard, I would greatly appreciate it. As you all know, I do give voice lessons and I'll put a link to that in the description. I also have a Patreon where you can support me if you like. I have decided that I do want to 
take this YouTube channel to the next level. And it's very difficult for me to do it in the, in my current financial situation, I would like to be able to make more videos every week more consistently, but given my financial state, it's just not possible for me to do it. I'd really need to be in a position where I can work less days so that I can commit more time to creating content, but I would like to get there one day and Patreon is a big help for that. So even if you could only donate a dollar or something, anything that you can do to help me work toward that goal would be greatly appreciated. So I can give back to you more because I love doing this and I want to give you as much content as I can. If you want more content from me, please like, please subscribe. I really hope that you've learned something from all this. Uh, and feel free to follow me on Instagram at Zach Ansley Vocals. I also have a Twitch channel. I'm about to start gaming on it some. That's the same thing, at Zach Ansley Vocals. And very soon, I will be reopening the Discord server to the public. I closed it down for some reasons for a little while, but it will be back up. And I really hope that we can keep building a community because the Discord server was awesome while I kept it open. And I want to expand it even more. So that's it. I hope you all have a good week, and I may make a video again this weekend. Maybe not. I don't know yet. But either way, if not, I'll put up another poll about next week's content, and I will see you all again soon. Thanks. Bye.